Welcome to Math 202 review sessions. I see a number of familiar faces from Math 201, a couple of new faces. Who knows who's watching online? I can't really see you, but I presume there will be some. So anyway, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with these sessions from Math 201, uh, basically they're a they're optional, so you can leave right now if you want to. In fact, you can come and go as you please as long as you don't disturb too much. They don't feel like you need to stay for the whole thing, or it's, it's okay if you come late too, that's fine. And of course, you will be able to watch the videos uh, online throughout the whole semester. So, um, right, so we're doing linear algebra. Uh, not calculus at all. Not calculus. Actually, I have to say, well, I have to say two things. One is that, uh, you will see my facial hair get longer and longer because I'm actually entering a charity beard growing contest. <laughs> I swear to you, it is true. It is not just an excuse. I'm trying to uh, help raise a little money for, uh, <laughs> for autism education for children. And, uh, and this is a good excuse not to shave as well. So anyway, uh, uh, by the midterm, it should be pretty scary. Uh, the next thing, though, seriously, is, is this, this no, no, is okay. Okay. So. I haven't taught a non-calculus course before, for a long time, at least. So, um, so this is going to be fun for me too, or at least fun for me. So, here goes. <laughs> before I begin, are there any sort of general questions on people's minds at this point, just about the course, about the sessions, just something? Go ahead. Do you have any idea if it's smaller than Math one I feel like a lot fewer. Uh, you mean you mean is the course enrollment yeah. smaller? Um, I don't know. There are quite a lot of sections of it, though. I think there are maybe ten, nine or ten sections. Of it. You should still be looking at high one hundreds. Um, I'm not sure if that's smaller, but I mean, there's fewer people here, but it's the first time. You know. I'd imagine the night before the midterm, it'll be hard to get a seat. And that's how it goes. Um, any other general questions? Well, I can tell you that uh, these are review sessions as well. So I'm not going to really be going ahead. And I know that the homework, come in, come in. I know that the homework's sort of just been handed in. And it, it, take a long-term view. OK, this is my whole approach is that, OK, the homework's important, but it's kind of good for you to struggle through it. It doesn't count for very much in terms of the final grade, but it is very useful to make sure you're keeping up. But I'm, t I'm looking at the midterm. I'm looking at the, well, the quiz and the midterm and the final. So I'm just trying to consolidate this knowledge from the previous week. That's, that's the philosophy. So rather than just sort of do a quick fix to get you through the homework and then you forget all about it, I, I kind of want to just really reinforce these concepts and do a lot of examples. Now, speaking of examples, I mean, last semester I didn't, there weren't too many brought in by you guys, and that's fine. I mean, if you bring in questions, well, you have a question on something from the homework that wasn't clear to you, and that's ideal. That's ideal. If you ask me about next week's homework, I'm liable not to uh, to show you exactly how to do the problem, but we can, you know, I can give you some hints as well. So that's the general philosophy. So I tend to redo a lot of what you did in the lectures, but with more examples, because I assume you've already seen the theory. These are not supposed to replace the, the regular classes either. I'm assuming that you've seen it before. Okay, so. Let's, uh, let's sort of dive in. So I, I'm going to try to cover all of chapter 1 and the first, well, 2.1 and maybe 2.2. So it should be sort of bringing us up to where you are now in class. Different classes move at different rates. But in any case, uh, this is in the way. And it's full of cables. OK, that'll do. People can still get in. Um, right, so look, we're dealing here with matrices pretty, pretty much the whole course. So I might as well tell you what a matrix is or remind you, of course, you've seen them. Okay, so there's some confusion about n by m. If you say an n by m matrix, it's maybe not so intuitive that it should have n rows and n columns. And if you write the coefficients in a standard sort of way, then the top row goes a11, a12, up to a1m. There are n of these numbers, m of these numbers this way. And then a21, a31, and so on, up to an1. There are n of them that way. 
I, the reason I think this is a little, little counterintuitive is if you think of this as the x coordinate and this is the y coordinate, it's wrong. That should be a two one. It's like that's that's the point two comma one. At least if this was going positive and positive, but that's just not how it's done. I'm sorry. The, this is how it's done in linear algebra, so you just got to deal with it. And this goes all the way through to a n m. Now, this is a nice little formal construct. It's a, it's a very convenient thing, but what you really want to do is think of it as a coefficient matrix. So these are coefficients of equations. And most of the applications, at least at first, we can sort of move into the more theoretical aspects of matrices, but normally underlying this is the idea that these represent so-called linear combinations. This is moving. That term is not introduced until 2.1 or 2.2, but whatever. You've seen that now. What I'm thinking of is that the first row represents a11, x1, plus a12, x2, and so on, up to a1, m, x, m, that expression, where x1, x2, up to x, m are variables. Now, if, of course, this is only a 3 by 3 <laughs> matrix or something, if m is 3, then you could use x, y, and z instead of x1, x2. But in general, we just don't have letters of the alphabet that are obvious. Even if you start at A, B, C, you quickly run out. Or at least if you're working in more than 26 dimensions, you will run out. So of course, you have to resort to these subscripts here. All right, so that first column, uh, the first row, rather, I want you to think of as sort of mentally representing that. And there's a separate linear combination for each row. and so on, until you get to the last row. And you've used up all the coefficients. So there's n different sort of linear combinations of these variables x1 through xm. Now, what you often want to do is say, oh, this equals something. This equals something. So what you would do in that case is if, for example, the first one equals b1, the second one equals b2, and so on, to the last one equals bn, there's n of these equations now, then what you would do is put a dotted line, or sometimes a solid line, and you'd fill in these b1s, b2s, up to bn. And now this is called an augmented matrix. We've taken the coefficient matrix and augmented it by one column, which are not really coefficients, but are rather constants on the right side. Now, the reason this course is called linear algebra is that these are linear equations. What is a linear equation? Well, basically, it's a generalization of a line. So a plane is like a line in two dimensions, or in three dimensions. It's a two-dimensional line in three dimensions. And we'll see subspaces soon enough, and these are sort of the general idea. So these are all linear equations, and it's worth understanding the geometry of what can happen. So because we cannot think in m dimensions, which is what this is, we might as well just work in three dimensions. So the first thing to understand is that, and we, we saw this in Math 201, for those of you who've done it, is that if you have something like this, ax plus by plus cz equals on the capital C, or C, whatever this number is, that's a plane. With a plane... So the variables are x, y, z. There's a plane in the x, y, z space with normal a, b, c. So it looks something like this. There's the normal a, b, c, or maybe it's pointing the other way. And this gives you some sort of plane. And now, when you assert several of these sorts of equations, then let's say m equals 3. So if I have some number of these equations, what I'm doing is trying to find all the points that lie on all of these planes. You, you're looking at n different planes. So if I'm, if I'm in an n by 3 matrix case, maybe an augmented case, um, what I'm, so n by 3 plus the 1, what I'm looking at is n different planes. So what are all the points on all the planes? So if two of the planes are parallel, then there's going to be no solutions at all. If there are only two planes and they intersect, there could be infinitely many solutions which lie on a line. But if there's three planes, then they could just intersect in a point. 
If there's four planes, they might also intersect in the same point. Or if the new plane doesn't go through the point, there might be no solutions. Okay, so there's going to be some relationship between the number of solutions and the geometry of the thing. Because we're dealing with more than three dimensions most of the time, or a lot of the time, it's not always going to be possible to draw what we're doing. But it's good to have an intuitive idea that what we're really doing is looking at intersections of planes or hyperplanes in higher dimensions. A question? Plus one, just make it an augmented. Yeah, I just meant that I'm adding an augmented column there so that uh, you know the, this would be A, B, C, capital C for this one equation. And then, of course, you have other equations. And for each equation, you fill it in. So it'll be a 4 by n matrix. But the interpretation, since we've got the, the vertical line, is that it's the, the coefficient part of the matrix is 3 by n, or n by 3. So there's n three-dimensional objects. And then the 1 just tells you that the capital C controls not the direction of the plane, but where it is. As you change, little a, b, c is the direction of the normal. And capital C controls like how far up or down it is along that direction. Okay, so that's yeah, that's what I meant. Three plus one. So it will look like four, but the line distinguishes between the coefficients and the uh, right-hand side of the equations, the constants. Okay. All right. Well, that's look. At, that's just a little bit of a of an introduction. Following 1.1, 1 .1. uh, the question is how we're going to solve these matrices. And there's a technique called Gauss-Jordan elimination. Now, the entire section one much faster than you. It can do it much faster than me. But like a lot of things, it's useful to just know the algorithm. Uh, you know, when you get, if you happen to have to solve a whole lot of linear equations, you probably want to use a computer in the end. Okay, but Gauss managed to do huge matrix reductions to solve astronomical problems without uh, computers. So, you know, along the lines of Taylor series and all that other stuff, we ought to know how to do it. So here it is. The idea is to reduce the matrix to an equivalent form. All right, now, there's certain things you can do with equations. You can divide them by constants. If you have two equations that are true, you can add them together, you can subtract them, you can multiply one by three and then subtract it. This is all stuff that you learned in high school solving sort of baby sim um, simultaneous equations, you know, like two variables and that sort of stuff. Um, for, for many variables, it's, it's not so easy. So I, I need to go over the algorithm of how, to, of how to do it. And it's presented very clearly in the book. Um, you know, it's, it's not particularly exciting, but you need to practice it. You need to practice, and it, it doesn't understand what you're doing. So, in order to sort of, well, I'll just present the algorithm, and I, I, you've seen it in class, and you can read it in the book. I'll present it, then I'll, I'll just do a couple of examples and see what's going on. Okay, so you, you're starting with some matrix, and you, let's say it's augmented. If it's not augmented, the same trick still works. You just do it as if it were not, as if it were augmented, or vice versa. The line makes no difference to this. So that's the first thing I want to say. That if you're eliminating just the coefficients, it's basically the same. OK, but for this example, I'll, I'll always put an augmentation in there, the extra column on the right. OK, so the first thing is, and they, they use this term cursor. OK, by the way, this is called Gauss-Jordan elimination, but it's sometimes known as Gaussian elimination, or at least it is in a stretch. So if I call it Gaussian elimination, just pretend I said Gauss Jordan. Maybe Jordan's first name was Ian. OK, well, that was worth a try. I doubt that it was true, though. Uh, actually, I have no idea what his first name was. All right, so basically what we're going to do is reduce this matrix to what is called an RREF, reduced row echelon form, which has a particular, it has a particular form, and I'll talk about that in a second. OK, so the algorithm says the following. There's your old matrix. What you've got to do is pick a cursor. Okay? I never heard that term before used in this, but you know, it's a computer term, I guess. We're just looking for where to start, and we're going to mark that thing. So basically, the cursor is almost is normally going to start here on the top left corner. But that could fail when you have a column of all zeros. So actually, what you want to do is sort of skip those. They're, they're sort of irrelevant. That would be like saying 0x is this 0x equals this 0x. 
x doesn't come into it in any of the equations, so that variable is sort of dead. It can be whatever it likes. It doesn't affect anything. So we want to ignore those rows. So the step 0, which is not explicitly said, I mean, it's sort of at the top of the algorithm in the book, but it's just like cursor is basically the top left, or the, the top entry of the first non-zero column. So you sort of ignore the columns at the beginning that are all zeros and find the, there's your cursor. Okay, these are all zeros. Then there's something non-zero. Of course, if the whole matrix is zero, well, then you don't really have any equations at all. It's like 0x plus 0y plus 0z equals zero. whoop de doo That's true for any x, y, z, whatever. So hopefully there's a non-zero uh, row, or column rather, and so the cursor you're going to put at the beginning. OK, fine. Now, you also don't like a zero at the cursor position. So what you have to do is you work your way down until you find that first non element. OK, so zero is the preparatory step. So step one is that you want to find the first non-zero row or non-zero element by working down. And swap the row up to the first row. OK, so let's just look at what, I mean, the first is just to pick a cursor. That does nothing. What does swapping these two things do? Well, in terms of these equations, if you transpose two of the rows, or when I say swap, I mean, you can either swap or you can just bring it up and shove the other ones down. All we're doing is writing these equations in a different order. That's what the step corresponds to. If necessary, write them in a different order. Well, that doesn't do anything, right? And that's just, we, we haven't even manipulated them. We've just written them down in a different order, right? x plus y equals 2, x minus y equals 3. That's the same as x minus y equals 3, x plus y equals 2. It's, it's really a no-brainer. OK, so now we can guarantee, after step one, that, OK, we have zeros here. But the, the non-zero has now been moved to the top and whatever else this is. OK, so the next step is sort of just a convenience step. So divide, we're going to divide the top row, or the, divide the cursor row. So the cursor is still here. That's our focus. We've just moved, switched the rows around. So this, the cursor is here. Divide the cursor row by the non-zero number, number at the cursor. So when I say divide the row, I mean we're going to divide every number in the row, including the augmentation. OK, so in the equation, what we've done is divide this equation by one of the numbers, by one of the coefficients. And of course, that's an acceptable operation. You're allowed to divide an equation by a number. So we're changing the coefficients, sure, but we're still remaining consistent with the original equations. We're not changing the equations as such. Or we're not changing the solutions to the equations. We're changing the equations effectively. Anyway, step three, now you have a one here. Whatever this is, you've now got a one because you've divided by whatever the non-zero one is, and that's kind of nice. OK, so now you have to find for every other row in the entire picture, in the entire matrix, what you have to do is subtract a multiple of this specific row to get zeros in that cursor column. So subtract a multiple of that cursor row to make all of the rest of the column where the cursor is, the cursor column, 0. 
And you can do that, no matter what the coefficients are. You, like if the coefficient here is 3, you subtract 3 times this row from here. And that will knock out the 3. If it's a minus 1, you add 1 times the row. Of course, subtracting minus 1 is the same time as adding 1. So you can clearly do that, and you can knock everything down to 0. Now, why is that acceptable? Well, again, all we're doing is adding a multiple of one equation to another. And we've decided that was allowed. No problem. This is true, 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 true times that plus that is also true. Question. Why is that still true if it's not an augmented matrix? Uh, well, if it's not an augmented matrix, there's a question of what you're actually doing. Right. right? Now, if it's not an augmented matrix, you may as well assume that it is with all zeros in the row. What you're really doing is manipulating the coefficients. But you are changing the geometry of the situation, no doubt about it. Right? I mean, it's not the same planes, but you will still get the same intersection point if you put any augmentation and respect the operations. Now, when I say respect the operations, I mean, you can't just, you cannot just do this. Take this, it's augmented. Ignore the augmentation, do the elimination, and then stick the augmentation back. That's not allowed. The augmentation has to go along. The one little case is that if the augmentation was all zero, namely the right-hand side of all these planes is zero, then it is respected. Okay. None of these things affect a zero. Okay, so if it's not augmented, you might as well think of it as augmented with a zero. Okay? But that's just a matter of philosophy at that point. So, another question. Um, can you, a more general question. Can you yeah. explain why, why are lines important? Like, why can't we do this with x squared? Why are lines important? Okay, the reason that lines are important is that really it comes down to A, they are the simplest geometric object, but moreover B, it's really to do with linear transformations. So lines are preserved by linear transformations. Now we haven't done them yet, but I'm hoping to do them. Well, you've, you've probably started them in class. Now, I'm going to define a linear transformation later on. But let me just say that things that are not even in this course that you have seen are linear. Just for the purposes of now, let's just say here the baby definition is that if you have two objects and you can add them together, then if I transform both those objects and add them together, it's the same thing as if I added them together first and then transformed. Okay? Now you've seen something like this. You could take two functions and add them together and get a new function such as x squared plus x cubed. Now these are not linear functions in x, but if you think of this as the sum of two functions and then you differentiate them, individually, the derivative of this is 2x and the derivative of this is 3x squared. Right? But the derivative, so the derivative of the whole thing is, in fact, 2x plus 3x squared. So what I'm trying to say is differentiation is a linear operation on functions even though you don't think of functions as vectors, if you do, then the derivative is a linear operation. So there's just many things that are linear, meaning that, you know, again, they preserve this addition. They also have to preserve scalar multiplication. More on that later. There's many things that are not even sort of finite dimensional which are linear. And so part of the objective of this course is to study not just planes Also, if you integrate the sum of two functions, that's the same thing as summing up the integrals. Okay, so there's just so many things that's, that are, are linear, and they're easy to deal with. In fact, you'll hear someone say, oh, chaos theory, that's all about nonlinear. And it is. Like fractals and all the sort of chaos stuff that was big, you know, fly effects, that's all nonlinear. Butterfly effect, you've heard of this, right? This is where, you know, butterfly flaps its wings and then generates a hurricane by some, you know, a few months later somewhere else in the world just because of this sort of cascading effect. Well, if it was linear, then a small thing here would produce a small thing there. Or at least if you double something here, you double it over here. But the butterfly is supposed to not be like that. So linear is important. Before you do nonlinear, you have to do linear. Okay? So that's, again, philosophy. So moving from the sublime to the ridiculous, or back to the last step of the algorithm, um, all that's left, so by now, what we've got is we're working our way along. We've either got all zero columns, 
or we've just got a one by itself in a column. And now we're working ourselves, we're working along with along with the switch over. You move the cursor down one step diagonally to the right. So you finish with this row and this column. So you're going to sort of now, having done that, we're going to focus. Well, we've now changed these as follows. We've got ones here, everything is zero. Everything is zero. This whole column is now zero. You might have some other ones up here, but that's it. And then what's left is you've got other stuff here, not zero. I'll just call it X. But you move down here and you start working on that row and then go back to one. And you basically finish when you get down to the bottom of the whole thing. And when you finish this, you are in this so-called reduced row echelon form, which is sort of surprisingly hard to describe. But basically, it consists of the following. So looking at a row, each row is all 0 or otherwise there is a leading one. So if you work from the left, the first non-zero entry is a one. And then that one has certain properties. So first of all, at this one, the rest of the column is zero. Also, the only, well, how do I want to say this? The only non-zero elements to the left of this one are above and to the left, or above, and are ones themselves. I'm not sure I said that probably. No, that's not true. Every row above is what this is what I really so so Every row above has a one to the left. That's the easy, that's the better way to say it. it. Has the leading one to the left. Okay, so that's the abstract theory of it. Now what we have to do is some examples. Okay, and then again, you should really be doing at least 10 of these just purely for practice. Question. For R -R -E yep. Is it supposed to say each column is all zero? Uh, each, well, it could be each row or it could be each column. But I, I, I meant to say each row, even though the way I've constructed it, what's going to happen is also you'll end up with an either a zero row or you work your way along the row, in which case the leading thing is a one. So I did mean row here. I mean, it's also possible that a column is zero as well. So working your way down a column. So from the column point of view, either a column has a leading one, in which case it has nothing else, or it has other, other stuff, or it's all zero. It's not that there's quite a few clean by doing columns. Anyway, this will all be clear when we do some more examples. Anyway, so here's an example. Suppose that you have, actually these things take up a lot of room, so I'll have to move over here. So I'll give you a three by three example. Again, this is just the sort of gentle introduction as it were, but this is how you have to begin with, an, with a nice little algorithm like this. All right, so here goes. Actually, what? So, three variables, x, y, and z. x minus 3y plus z equals 4. 2x minus 8y plus 8z equals minus 2. Minus 6x plus 3y minus 15z equals 9. 
So the question is to solve these three equations simultaneously. Then so you could do it without matrices, but it's much, much, much more convenient to do it with matrices. So basically what I'm going to do is just copy out the coefficients. Now, by the way, if we were really, really cruel, we could swap these around and write, you know, 8z minus 8y plus 2x, and then you'd have to sort of re-manipulate them back into this order. So that would be like a ridiculous trick, but I've seen it done. So just beware of just blindly copying. Make sure that the variables all line up first. And by the way, if you have a missing variable like this, if this was the second equation, you'd have to mentally change this to 0x. Okay? So just a little word of caution. Zeros can be coefficients as well. So anyway, we have 1, 3, 1, 1 minus 3, 1, 4. And just copying out these coefficients. There's the augmented matrix. And now I pr propose to perform a Gauss-Jordan elimination on this. Okay, so according to this, we sort of start at the first non-zero column. There it is. There's the cursor. Now, it happens to have a non-zero element, so we don't have to do any switching. So we've already done step zero and one. Now, step two says divide this top element, this top row, by one. Well... Why 1? Because that's the, co that's the number here. But dividing by 1 is silly, so we don't, it doesn't do anything. So actually, we've already done step 2 as well. So you don't have to do anything. Actually, now we do. Step 3 says, for every other row, we subtract an appropriate multiple of this first row. So there's the cursor row. So in this, I'm going to say, take this whole line and subtract twice the first line. So by the way, it's not a good idea to put an equals from there, because the matrices are not equal. I just put like an arrow or something to indicate, I don't know if it should be one-sided or two-sided. All this stuff should be reversible anyway, so it can be, be one-sided or two-sided, but I just want to sort of say don't put equals here. All right, so I'm going to take this row and subtract twice that row. So the first row remains unscathed. And now the second row, okay, so this will get a zero there. Minus eight, minus two times minus three. You've got to really keep track of all these minuses, uh, and you get pretty, pretty good at it. So minus eight plus six is minus two. Eight minus two is six. And then minus two, minus two lots of four. Okay, so minus two, minus eight, should be minus ten. Now this one I'm going to add six times this row. So minus 6, I'm now adding instead of subtracting. Okay, 3 minus 18 is negative 15. Oops. Minus 15, subtract, uh, I'm sorry, add 6 times that, you get minus 9. And then 4, add 6, add 6 times 4 to 9, you get 33. Okay, any questions so far? Well, I've got to move over here now because this thing's just take up so much space. All right, so now step four just says move the cursor row, cursor down here. So there we are. Top row is sort of fine. Now we're working on the second row. We will come back and change the top row for a second. This is non-zero, so divide by minus two. And you get one minus three, five. By the way, a little bit of technique, I guess. Well, what do I want to say? Yeah, okay. What the hey? Uh, it wouldn't hurt to just divide this by 3, even though it's not technically in the algorithm. Uh, it seems to me that it's easier to add 5 lots of something than 15 lots of something. So I'm going to change, divide this already by, by 3 or by minus 3. I, I, 3 will do. So I'm sort of cheating here. I'm disobeying the algorithm. But notice I sneak, sneaky dividing division by 3. OK. So anyway, what's next? Well, having done that, I want to use this one to kill off this and this. So I'm going to add three lots of this row to here. So I will get one, zero. Now add three lots of minus three to one. You get negative eight. 
Don't forget to do this side, add three lots of five to four and you get 19. All right, then what's next? This row survives. And now here's where my sneaking is paid off. I'm gonna add five rows, five times this to this, not, not 15, which is what I would have had to do before. Okay, so add five lots of this row and you get a zero here. Now minus three plus five lots of minus three is negative 18. And then 11 plus five lots Right now the cursor comes down here. Okay, well, that's non-zero. I'll divide by negative 18. So I have 1, 0, minus 8, 19, 0, 1, minus 3, 5. Divide by minus 18, I get 1, negative 2. Okay, well, I still have to now add three lots of this row to here and eight lots of this row to here. So this will be the final step. If I add eight lots of this to this, I get one, zero, zero, three. And if I add three lots of this to this, I get a zero here and a minus one. And the last row remains as minus two. And there's nothing more you can do. Okay, so what have we done? Well, along every step of the way, you could convert this matrix back to a system of equations. For example, if you took this one, you could say x minus 3y plus z equals 4, 0 x minus y plus 6z equals minus 10, and minus 15y minus 9z equals 33. Now, that's not the same set as this, but the solutions of these two are identical. That's the whole point. And you work your way through, and every one of these scenarios you could reduce to another set of equations, all of which are just linear manipulations of these three linear equations. Okay, now if you did the same thing at the very last step, you would simply have x equals 3, 1x equals 3, 1y equals minus 1, and 1z equals minus 2. So the beauty of these steps is they're all reversible. So you, you can manipulate that down to that. And so you found the answer. There's one solution, and that's it. The vector is 3 minus 1 minus 2. All right? So there's the first example I want to show of Gaussian elimination, or Gauss-Jordan elimination. Any questions about it? I mean, it's sort of straightforward, but practice. All right, all right. Let's do another couple of examples, but I won't go into quite as much detail. It's really easy to make numerical errors here, by the way, so if you see me make any, then please let me know. All right, so here's a 4x4 four four case, just to show you. That they're not that scary. I'm, rather than write it as a system of equations, I'll just write it just straight away as a matrix form. So let's do a bit of work on this. All right, so the first cursor starts up there. Again, I don't have to divide. It's nice enough to have a one there. So I'll leave the first row as it is. I'm gonna subtract three lots of the first row. So minus 12 minus minus, minus three lots of minus three is minus three. A zero is lovely because you don't have to do anything. You just copy the same element, minus two, minus three lots of zero, okay, fine. Minus 27 minus three lots of minus five works out to be minus 12. 
And similarly, minus 33 minus, minus 21 is also minus 12. All right. Now add two lots of the first row to this row. So that kills off this. Just two lots of minus 3 being added gives you 4. Again, 0 is our friend. Uh, two lots of minus 5 is brings us down to 24 and two lots of um, 14 rather and two lots of 7 from 29 is 15. And finally, to this row, I add the top row. Minus 1 is kind of nice like that. So I'm just adding these. 14 minus 5 is 9, 17 minus 7 is 10. Okay, jolly good. So that's the next, that's the next stage. All right, well, unfortunately, the cursor moves down here. We have to divide by negative 3. So I get 1, 2 thirds, 4, and 4. This time, I'm not going to do anything sneaky, because I don't see any common factors in, in any of these. So there's sort of no point in doing what I did over here, where I just saw, ah, 3 was a common factor. Saved a few little brain cycles. OK, so the next step is just work on this. Add 3 lots of this row to this row. So that kills off this 3. 3 times 2 thirds is 2. 3 times 4 is 12. 3 times 4 is 12. Added to minus 7. OK. This second row remains unscathed. As for the third row, subtract 4 lots of this. And now you have to do a little bit of annoying stuff with fractions. 2 minus 8 thirds is 6 thirds minus 8 thirds, so that's negative 2 thirds. 14 minus 16 is negative 2. 15 minus 4 lots of 4 is negative 1. And finally, now subtract 3 lots of this row from here. 1 minus 2. 9 minus 12. 10 minus 12. All right. Now, let's move over here. OK, so now we attack this row. And what do we get? Well, let's keep the 1, 0, 2, 7, 5. 0, 1, 2 thirds, 4, 4. Um, divide this by 2 thirds, i.e., uh, minus 2 thirds, i.e., multiply by minus 3 halves. And you get 1 there, the minus goes away, and you get 1, and then, uh, I'm sorry, you get 3, and then 3 halves. Whereas here, I'm just going to sneakily multiply by minus 1 already. So this is a slightly sneaky thing. Sneaky. It's out of the algorithm. But I've done this for a purpose. We're not even all the way through the complete elimination. But I want you to think of, I want, well, does anyone see a problem already that's going to arise when we actually try to solve it? Yeah. You'll get an inconsistency. You'll get an inconsistency. So what does that mean? What, what's the problem, the final two lines? If these variables are x, y, z, and w, just look at these last two equations. This one says, well, I'll work down here. The second last equation says that z plus 3w equals 3 halves, whereas the last equation says z plus 3w equals 2. So I don't care what x and y are. There's no way that you can pick any z and w that make both these things true, because 2 is not the same as 3 halves. OK, now, if we continue with the algorithm, we'll soon see what's going wrong. OK, so the top two are not really posing much of a problem. We still have to play pat and subtract twice this row from here if we want to do the complete elimination. So we get 0, 7 minus 6 is 1, 
and then twice this row, so three away from five. And now we're going to subtract three halves, I'm sorry, two thirds of this row from here. So that'll kill off this. Two thirds of three is two. Subtract from four is two. Two thirds of three halves is one. So you get a three over here. This row we don't touch because we're working on it. And this bottom row will just subtract this row from this row. So we'll get 0, 0, 0, 0. And then 2 minus 3 halves is 1 half. And now this bottom one is the real problem. We've transformed these two equations by subtracting it. And basically what you end up with 0 equals 1 half. That's what this last row says. 0, x, y, 0, 0 equals one half, and that's clearly a problem. Now, technically, we haven't quite finished the elimination because we've still got one cursor row, although we can already see it's a lost cause. We're supposed to divide that equation by a half. Well, if zero equals a half, then zero also equals one. Okay, so we can do the same thing. You have to rewrite. The next step is to rewrite but change the one half to a one. So I'll just do that. I'm saving myself a, a step. And then, actually, we're supposed to subtract, say, two lots of this row from here, and three lots of this row from here, and three halves lot of that row from there. So that is actually going to kill off all of these right-hand numbers in this line. You get zero. So that's the completely reduced one. So again, every row, the first one, has all of the rows above the leading ones are to the left. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's supposed to be, this, this is supposed to be the complete, the complete form. I mean, it, if they ask for the, yeah, the complete Gauss-Jordan elimination, you have to get it down into that form. Okay, because again, every row has a leading one, including the last row. And all of the other entries in that row have to be a zero. That's the definition of reduced row echelon form. The, the other part about how they're all to the left just means that you have the equations in the right order, so that it looks like a staircase, as opposed to like if you switch them and have a one and a one. I mean, look, again, it's a question of philosophy. If it's a half and they're all zeros, then, you know, it's still, it's, still a mean, it's still an inconsistent thing. But if you didn't have the augmentation there, and that's, that's clearly in reduced form, and that's not, okay? Because there's no lead. Every row has to have a leading one or be all zeros, and, and the augmentation is included. Another question. Second row, how do we go from one, two, three, four, four, two, one, three? Uh... Okay, so you're saying, how did I get from here to here, specifically the second row? Okay, so at this point, my cursor was here, right? Just to remind you, in the previous thing, it was still here, but I multiplied by, or I divided by minus two thirds to make it a one. Okay, now what I have to do is use this row on all the other rows to get, to knock out these elements. Okay, so for the first row, I subtracted two lots of this row. And then that gave me a zero there. And these numbers got adjusted. For the second row, I had to subtract two thirds of this row. And that's how it worked, okay? All right. So I'm going to give another semi example. Actually, maybe I'll just do the whole thing. What the hey? Then we can probably change the tape. All right. So the other example is a slightly smaller matrix. Um, I want to solve the following equations. I'm going to write them out. There's six variables. So by the way, the previous equation, those equations that were represented have no solution. Right? I, I said it along the way. But as soon as you see a row that's 0, 0, 0, 0, and then a 1 on the right, it means 0 equals 1, which cannot be, the, cannot be true. 
So there's no solution. Okay, so the first case, there was exactly one solution. The second case, there were no solutions. Here's a case where there's infinitely many solutions. So we have x4 plus 2x5 minus x6 equals 2. x1 plus 2x2 plus x5 minus x6 is equal to 0. And x1 plus 2x2 plus 2x3 minus x5 plus x6 equals 2. OK, six variables, but only three equations. Without even thinking about it, well, I mean, without even doing it, just thinking about it, what, what are the possibilities? Could you only have one solution with six unknowns and only three equations? No. So do you have to have infinitely many solutions? Or no. There could be no solutions. So if you think about it, Suppose you only had two planes. Could they possibly intersect in just one point? Three unknowns, really, two planes, you see. They could be parallel and have no intersections, or they could intersect in a line, and there would be infinitely many. But there's no way you can have just one solution. So here, of course, I'm not going to ask you to try to think about five-dimensional hyperplanes in six-dimensional space. But nevertheless, if you could, then you would realize them can either have no intersection or intersect in infinitely many points. All right, so anyway, let's just convert this into a matrix and do our little elimination. The first one is 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, minus 1, augment by 2. The second is 1, 2, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, augment 0. And finally, 1, 2, 2, 0, minus 1, 1, 2. So notice how I've put zeros where the coefficients were empty. Now, it looks sort of fierce because there are six columns plus the extra one, so seven columns. But it really, it's the number of rows that takes a long time in this. The first thing we are going to have to do, you start up here. That's no good, though, because it's non-zero. So I'm going to switch these rows first. One, two, zero, zero, one, minus one, zero. And then 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, minus 1, 2. Buckle my shoe. 1, 2, 2, 0, minus 1, 1, 2. All right. So now what's next? OK. So this is already a 1, so I don't have to divide by it. This, L, this thing, I don't actually, I have to sort of subtract 0 times this row. I don't have to do anything with that row. So it's only the third row that I actually have to touch. So I, I'm now going to subtract one lot of this row from this row. Minus 1, minus 1 is negative 2. 1 minus minus 1 is 2. And 2 minus 0. So it's become considerably simpler. Now, here I have a non-zero entry. So the cursor would move here, but actually this is a first non-zero column. So once I've moved the cursor down to here, they're all zeros. So there's nothing to do. So I have to move along to the next column. And here, the 2 is the significant element, but it's down the bottom. So I'm going to have to switch this and this. OK, so I'm going to actually switch this. This is the next thing I care about. Now, it's not a 1. In the process of switching, I might as well also divide by the 2. Why write out the matrix twice? So I'm going to move up over here and start writing a little smaller. But there's so many zeros, so we should get away with it. 1, 2, 0, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. And now we're switching and dividing by 2. So I have 0, 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 1, 1. And then let's just leave this other one. 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, minus 1, 2. All right, so now what? What's the next step? What's the next cursor element? Well, the cursor was here because we switched the rows around, but now it moves down here. So you've you got to divide by 1. OK, that doesn't do anything. And then you've got to take care of the non-zero elements in that row. Well, that doesn't do anything either, as in we're done. That's already in reduced row echelon 4. OK, again, the way to check. Work along every row. There's the one. All zeros. Good. Next row, there's the one. All zeros. Good. 
There's the one. All zeros. Done. That's it. There's nothing else that can be done. Okay? And notice that the ones are getting later and later. That's the other point of it. Is you don't want a one down here. Okay, so you have to know when to stop. Now, my question is, how do you have to convert that to the solution? It's not as easy as the first example, where we could just read the solution off, nor is it as easy as the second example, where we could see there was no solution right at the beginning. So how do we convert this to the solution? Well, the difference here is that you have free variables. Not three, but there happen to be three. There are three free variables, okay? Basically, here's x1, x3, and x4, which correspond to a 1, in each case, a leading 1. And these are not free. Non-free. Whereas the ones that do not correspond to a leading 1, which I'll just write down here, just for convenience, x2, x5, and x6, happen to be free. So basically, what I'm saying is free variables... So you have to find the free variables, which are not associated, so they're the columns without leading ones. So columns without leading ones correspond to free variables. So here's what I intend to do. I intend to let x2 equals, say, what, is the, what does the book use? R. I intend to let x2 be equal to just R. And I intend to let x5 be equal to S and x6 be equal to T. Okay? So these are my three variables. The second, fifth, and sixth columns happen to have nothing in it. So I'm just going to call them R, S, and T. You can actually leave them as X2, X5, and X6. But it's kind of cleaner to just, just choose completely different letters and set it up like that. Now let's look at this first equation here. The first equation says, as rough work, it says X1 plus 2X2 plus X5 minus X6. So if we put everything except for the x1 on the other side, we have x1 is negative 2x2 minus x5 plus x6. Now I want you to notice that everything on the right is one of the free variables. Just, just because of the way that it's set up. So you can replace this by r, s, and t. So x1 is equal to minus 2r minus s plus t. Now let's repeat for the second equation. The second equation says x3 minus x5 plus x6 equals 1. You see how I've taken the coefficients from over here, x3 minus x5 plus x6 equals 1, and I've just copied it over. And I, again, make x3 the subject. It's very easy. The coefficient here is guaranteed to be a 1. So you just have to throw everything on the other side. And you get x5 minus x6 plus 1. And, of course, x5 is s, and x6 is t. So we're saying x3 is minus... No, is plus t... No, plus s. Minus t plus 1. Okay, and we have one more equation. x4, from that bottom row, x4 plus 2x5 minus x6 equals 2. So throwing everything on the other side, you have x4 is minus 2x5 plus x6 plus 2. And so, here it is, x4 is equal to minus 2s, because x5 is s, plus t plus 2. And maybe I'll line these up a little better. X5 is S and X6 is T. I kind of did that on purpose. Although, of course, you could just write them out so that they're not aligned. I tried to line up the R's, the S's, and the T's, and then the constants on the right. Okay, so the point is that the solution that we have found has three extra unknowns. 
any choice of R, S, and T, when plugged in, gives you a solution. You plug in the R, S, and T. You pick your three favorite numbers, any real numbers at all, R, S, and T. You plug them in, and you get a, a, a six-tuple of numbers, which satisfy the original three equations over there. So that is the complete solution to the system. Well, Question. The question is, why does it matter which variables you choose as the free ones? Well, it's all to do with how the elimination works, right? The point is that when you have a leading thing, you know that none of the other leading columns are involved. In this equation, it's only the leading one. The, all the other leading ones have zeros. So those variables do not appear. So none of the other leading ones appear. So that means the only ones left over are free. Yeah, it won't, it won't work unless you get the right combination of them. Okay. I mean, if you can do different eliminations, but essentially the, the, there are different ways of writing the solution. But if you're going to use this coordinate system, then you have to use those free variables. Otherwise, they won't have a proper system. They won't, yeah, you won't be able to, to do it. I mean, you'll be, you'll be stuck more like in the original. You, you won't be as reduced as possible, is what I'm trying to say. All right, so before I take the tape changing break, I just want to comment that another way of writing this as a vector is you can think of this as x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, x6. And by the way, that vector, I might as well say now, I'm thinking of as a 6 by 1 matrix. That's another way of thinking of it. I like to write the vectors vertically. So how many lots of r is it? Well, if I just copy the coefficients, I get minus 2, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, plus s is I've got minus 1 from the first equation, 0 from the second, 1 from the third, minus 2, 1, and then 0. The t only appears as a 1 in the first equation, 0, minus 1, 1, 0, 1, and then finally plus the constant vector, 0, 1, uh, sorry, 0, 0, 1, 2, 0, 0. Okay, so geometrically, in six dimensional space, you take this point plus any multiple of this vector plus any multiple of this vector plus any multiple of that vector. It's sort of hard to visualize. But that will flesh out the entire solution space. Every choice of R, S, and T gives you a solution, and every solution corresponds to some choice of R, S, and T. Any questions about that? You notice that there's three different techniques, although the first two are very simple. The first one, you get and you just write down the solution. Second case, there's no solution because you have a 0, 0, 0, 1. Third case, you have to do a lot more work with free variables. Okay, So that's the idea. No questions about this? All right. So, it should be very quick. There is no, no, I mean, there are eliminations, but they will be two by two or something. Oh, like yeah. That. Maybe I'll go this with it. Are you going to be there afterwards? Where? It's, uh, here. Yeah. Okay, I'll go with uh, 930. It's, it's a complicated thing. It will take too long to do, I'm afraid. But I will go over it. Okay. So, we have seen that you could get one solution. You could get infinitely many, or you could get none. And so we've already heard the word consistent means that there is a solution, but there might be infinitely many. Inconsistent means no solutions. So that's pretty much it. Now, we do have a very important definition, which you have to know. Uh, this is not the proper way to state it. We will find later on a better way to state it. But for the moment, I want to say that the rank of a matrix, of a coefficient matrix, No, it's not the augmented. So A is the whole matrix together. It's just a coefficient matrix. The rank is, for the moment, going to be the number of leading ones. In the reduced row echelon form. So for the moment, 
The only way we can find a rank of a matrix is to do this Gauss-Jordan elimination and then see what you get. So in this last case, the rank was 3. Why was it 3? 1, 2, 3. Every row, as it turns out, had a leading 1, but not every column. Okay, so that's the idea of the rank. Now, the previous example, you may recall that we ended up with a matrix that looked something like this. 1, 0, 0, whatever it was. So forget the augmentation. We ended up with 0, 1, 0, forget what it was exactly, 0, 0, 1, and something, and then 0, 0, 0, 0. So the rank of that is only 3, even though it's a 4 by 4 matrix. So the last row doesn't have any leading one. It's only one, two, three. So okay, the rank the rank makes perfect sense, sense, at least as a definition. What does it mean? Well, it indicates a number of things. When we do the geometrical interpretation, we'll see exactly what it indicates, and it's quite a, quite a natural thing to look at. But for the moment, let me just point out a few properties of the rank. So these are collected from the examples in the textbook, but they're sort of stuff that you should know. So this is what I think you should sort of at least know or have in the back of your mind or be aware of. Okay, so first of all, the rank... So A is assumed, by the way, to be an N by N. Again, it's N rows and M columns. So the rank of a matrix has to be less than or equal to N, and it also has to be less than or equal to M. So you cannot have a higher rank than either the number of rows or columns. In this case, if you have, say, a 3 by 6 matrix like this, then the most the rank could be is 3. Why? Because every row has at most one 1, most 1 leading 1. And same with the columns. There's no way there could be more than 6, because each column can have at most 1. So that's sort of an obvious fact. But nevertheless, it's nice to know. OK, if the rank of a matrix happens to be equal to n, then the equation, then it, any augmentation will be consistent. OK, so what does that mean? It means it's only the coefficients that matter. The augmentation doesn't matter. No matter how you augment it, if you have a matrix whose rank is the same as the number of rows, well, then you'll get a consistent, you'll get at least one solution. Now, why is it so? The answer is no free variables. No, that's not the answer. That's the next thing. <laughs> the answer is no 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 row. in the augmentation. Why not? Well, no matter, you know, you go through, you go through, you go through the steps, and the fact is that every row will have a 1 in the coefficient part of it. You don't have to go up to the augmentation like we did in that second example. Every row will have a 1 somewhere. And that means that you cannot have an inconsistent equation like 0, 0, 0, 1. There will always be some solution. If there's no free variables, then it will just be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and you can always solve it just by plugging in the variables. Uh, if there are free rows, then it turns out that you know, you're back in this sort of situation here. And so there are free variables, and there would be infinitely many solutions, but at least there is one. So it's just true for any augmentation if you have a rank n. And now the other one I wanted to say is that if the rank is equal to m, the same as the number of columns, so this is the number of rows, this is the number of columns, then there must be at most one solution. For any augmentation. And the reason here is that there is no free variables, right? Every column has a one, has a leading one, because we're assuming 
that the number of leading ones is the same as the number of columns. And you cannot have two leading ones in one column. So if this is true, then as you work your way down, they all have a leading one somewhere. And so there's no free variables. And if there's no free variables, there can't be infinitely many solutions. There could be one solution, or there could be no solutions. OK, if the rank happens to be less, So you, you mean a long, skinny matrix, yeah. right? And then you have somewhere under every like one, one, zero, zero, zero. Oh, so you mean that one column looks like that? Yeah. Yeah. Then there's no solutions. So it's not inconsistent. I said at most one solution. There could be at most one solution. Inconsistent has no so solution. Okay. Right? So what you should be on the lookout is a zero, 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 zero row with a 1, that gives you no solutions. Whereas if you have free variables, that gives you infinitely many solutions. So it's mostly either 0, 0, or 1. Yeah. So if the rank is the same as the number of columns, then you, you cannot have any Then you either, <laughs> so you cannot just have one solution. So you could have infinitely many or none. How would you tell? Well, by assumption, the matrix looks something like this. We have fewer free variables than columns. So that means that there's one column that is not a leading variable. So there's no leading one in this column. So that's a free variable. No leading one. There must be one column at least with no leading one, because otherwise, if they're all filled with a leading one, then this would be equal. Okay, so if if that's the case, you would expect to get infinitely many solutions, and you would, unless of course you get trumped by a a zero one row. Okay, so if the rank is less than one then it depends what's on the right. It depends on the augmentation. If you happen to have a row with no zero zeros, which is possible because the rank is not full, you can have a column with zeros, then it is possible, if you're lucky, there's a zero there, in which case you, you can have solutions. If you're unlucky, there's a one there, or some non-zero number, in which case you cannot have solutions. So it's possible to get either infinitely many or none, but you cannot just get one. By the way, I hope it's clear that you cannot just get two solutions. Can anyone just tell me why there could not possibly just be two solutions? It's linear. It's linear. So actually, that means that if you do have two solutions, then what? There are much more. Then the sum of them is also a solution, for example. Or the, at least the average of them. Okay, that, that's that's uh, some, some linear combination of them is what I mean. So you have to be a little bit careful. Actually, it depends on what's on the right. So maybe I shouldn't be talking, uh, talking about this yet. This will all become clearer later. So forget everything I just said. Uh, now, if n is less than m, so that means that the number of numbers is less than the number of numbers. So it's like sort of a wider matrix. Then you have the rank of a has to be no more than n. Well, we already saw that. Cannot be more than n or m. But in particular, it's less than m. So you cannot, so you're in this case, cannot just have, or must have infinitely, have infinitely many or no solutions. And that sort of goes to what I was saying before, we had a, a three by six matrix. We had six variables, but only three equations. So the problem here is, i.e., more variables than equations. More vars than equins. Okay, more variables than equations. That's what I mean there. So of course you can't just have one solution. If they're inconsistent, you might have no solutions, or you might have infinitely many.
All right. I only have one more point, and then I'm sort of going to move on with a vengeance. So the only other point is if you're dealing with a square matrix, if n equals m, it's a square matrix. OK, well, that's pretty obvious. If the rank is equal to n, or m, they're the same thing, then this means, because it's n by n, this means the reduced row echelon form has to look like this. All zeros. That's called the identity matrix. n by n. n by n identity matrix. Why? Well, every row and every column has to have a leading one. And that means that all the other entries in every row and every column are zero. Okay, and that's just basically no matter how you augment this, this will say x1 equals this, x2 equals this. So the solution would just be whatever the right-hand column is. So then you basically have the reduced row echelon form is this, and you get one solution. Otherwise, you might have infinitely many or none, depending on, once again, what the augmentation is. So if the bottom row is 0 and there's a 0 there, you could get infinitely many. If it's 0, 1, you would. It's the same as the previous case. But it's nice to know for a square matrix, then if you're going to have just a unique solution, the reduced row echelon form goes all the way to that identity matrix, the 1, 1, 1, which is, was the case in the first example I did. It was a 3 by 3 matrix, and reduced to 1, 1, 1. All right, any questions about anything I've said so far? All right. Yeah, question. If you have a row of all zeros, then it doesn't, it, it doesn't affect anything. As in, it's just a true, it's a truism. Okay, so you can more or less delete that row from the matrix, and it, it will be the same. Yep. So everything would reduce to one fewer equation. Okay. All right. Now, before, before I go on, I need to show you some housekeeping, bookkeeping. That's right. Okay, some facts. More facts, but not about the rank. More facts in general. OK. One, you can sum two matrices, but only of, but they both have to be of the same size, same dimensions. And it's really obvious how to add them up. You just add up the corresponding components. E.g., 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, plus 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, equals, notice they're both 2 by 3, so 1 plus 7 is 8, 2 plus 8 is 10, 3 plus 9 is 12, 4 plus 10 is 14, 5 plus 11 is 16, 6 plus 12 is 18. Okay, don't want to say anything else about that, that's just a little thing you have to know, because... Soon we're going to be adding up matrices. You can also multiply by a scalar, just like vectors. vectors. Matrices are very similar to vectors in this respect. You can add vectors. You can also multiply vectors by scalars. The same with matrices. So if I write something like this, 5 outside of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, this 5 is a scalar, I multiply every element, just like in the vector, by that constant. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. Okay, so it's useful to know what this means when you see 3 times a matrix. You should understand that that 3 distributes amongst all of the entries of that matrix. So clearly this works for any size matrix, whereas here you can only add up two matrices if they're exactly the same size. Otherwise it's meaningless as far as we're concerned. Okay, now I need to show you... Uh, about vectors. So normally we think of vectors as either row or column vectors, but the column is column is the main one. So even though we've been writing 1, 2, 3, typically you really want to think of a 
vectors being vertical. It's more convenient in this course to have it as vertical. Okay, so one, two, three, column vector. It's also possible to have it as a row. And then notice I'm writing it as a matrix, not as a vector. So I'm not, if I write it as a row vector at the, in this course, I'm not going to put so many commas. I'm just going to think of it as a matrix. Question? Yeah, when you put it in a row, uh, how many dimensions? Well, this would be a th three by one, and this would be a one by three. Right, but like, would the column describe like something in the x, y, z? Yeah, I mean, you can think of this as being, you know, one variable. This is like one lot of A, two lots of A, three lots of A, right? Whereas this is, is, is 1A plus 2B plus 3C. I mean, they, they have different interpretations. But for the moment, I, I, we want to be just introducing that and saying, hey, a vector could look like a matrix, depending on how you write it. And we'll be talking about row vector. If I mention row vector or col column vector, you'll know what I mean. So this is just a definition. Okay. So... I've already given you the identity matrix. But what I forgot to mention, and I should just add it over here, is that this is written I n. I subscript n is just a symbol that always means the n by n identity matrix. So it's got ones in the diagonal and zeros everywhere else, and it's square n by n. All right. So here is an important sort of introduction to matrix multiplication, which we're not going to do today. Uh, it goes like this. I want to talk about how to multiply a matrix by a vector. Is this 4? Oh, OK. Never mind. Uh, good. Matrix times a vector. Actually, this is still part of 3 and, well, whatever. I'll keep it as 4. Matrix times vector. So times a column vector in particular. OK, so I have this matrix. And the matrix is going to be n by m. And I'm going to have a vector which is m dimensional. So notice it's not the same number of columns. It's only one column, but it's got not the same number of rows. This has m rows, and this has m columns. All right, so what should this be? Well, I don't know what it should be. I'll tell you what it is. What you do is you think of, well, do I want to do this yet? No. What I want to do is think of this as columns. So I want to think of this x1 up to xm. I want to think of the matrix in terms of its columns for the moment. Okay, so it has m columns, each of which, all columns, are n vectors, n dimensional vectors. So I have m of them. They each have, you know, they have dimension n. And there are m of these. And so this is going to be a new vector, which is going to be x1 lots of v1 plus x2 lots of v2 and so on up to xm lots of vm. So this is a linear combination. This is called a linear combination. of v1 up to vm. So the m vectors in n-dimensional space. And when I add them up, this is still an n-dimensional an vector. Question? N-dimensional vector. Yeah, I should have said that. N-dimensional vector. OK, so. It means it's a vector with n components. So to be more concrete about it, if I had a, a 2 by 3 matrix, I would have three vectors in the plane. 
and I would be taking a linear combination of those three vectors. So if one vector was here, I'd be taking one lot of this vector plus five of this vector minus three of this vector or something like that. I'd still get a vector in the plane. Okay, so that's one way of thinking about a matrix times a vector. However, another way of thinking about it, alternatively, if you start still with an n by m matrix, then this time I want you to think of the rows as being vectors, which I'll call w. And there are n of them. But this time, there are all the rows are m-dimensional vectors. So if you think of them as m-dimensional row vectors, as in, I just wrote the, the entries out in a row, and I want to multiply by this vector x, which, again, I'll write this out as being longer because it's n, there's m dimensions here. Well, this is a new vector with the entries being the dot products. and so on. OK, so this is an n-dimensional vector. So we started with an m vector, and we end up with an n vector. OK, so the real magic in this, so first of all, I should remind you what a dot product is. This is just from from uh, math, 101, uh, math 201, rather, if a has been a1 up to, say, a n, uh, actually, let's do m, and b is b1 up to bm, then a, and these are supposed to be vectors, a dot b, you may recall, is a1 b1 plus a2 b2 plus dot 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 plus a m b m. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that this matrix times this vector is an n-dimensional vector that looks like this. This is the same as that, believe it or not. There's, there's no difference between these two characterizations. They are exactly the same thing. Question. Yep. They don't seem the same. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just do a simple example to show you that they're the same. Okay. So in order to do the, I'm going to do this example. What I want to say, though, is when I actually do this multiplication, I think about it the second way, not the first way. Okay. So that's the way I'm going to start, and then I'll show you by example that it's the same. Of course, but you'll see how it works and how really there's no difference between it. So I propose to take this matrix, which is 2 by 2, and multiply it by this vector. Uh, let's do 4 minus 1, 1. OK. Let's look at the second way. The second way says, what I do is take the dot product of this row with this matrix and enter it in the top one. So I'm going to take 1, 3, 2, and I'm going to take the dot product with this, 4 minus 1, 1. Take the dot product of this with this. What do I get? Well, I just do 1 times 4, 1 times 4, plus 3 times minus 1 plus 2 times 1. All right. Whereas the second row, I'll now take this row and dot product with the same vector. So I'm going to get 5 times 4 plus minus 1 times minus 1 plus 0 times 1. Now, as it happens, I can work this out as 4 minus 3 plus 2 happens to be 
uh, 3, and 20 plus 1 is 21. But just take a look at this. Let's just unpack the 4 for a second. This is 4 lots of 1, 5, plus minus 1 lots of 3, comma, minus 1, plus 1 lot of 2, 0. Right, so just by the fact that I used the 4 twice, once here and once here, and the minus 1 twice, once here, and 1 twice, there it is. Now, of course, this is 4 times the first column, plus minus 1 times the second column, plus trying to distinguish, plus 1 times the third column. Okay? So you see how it's the same thing? Maybe. I mean, at least by example. And you can see that the same technique is going to work. It's just the way the dot product is constructed is that the x1 will take the first one of each one. And I could peel that out of the dot product, which is after all the sum, and write it as a vector. Okay? If you don't believe me, try it with a bunch of different matrices. As soon as you expand it out the second way, just grab all of these coefficients and pull them out, and you'll see that what's left is just the columns of the matrix. Okay? A question. But you can always remember that you're going to have your result will be the same as your first matrix, right? It'll be of the same dimension. Uh, well, the, the number of columns, so it's basically n by m matrix times m vector equals n vector. Okay, And it's very clear from the second one. For these to be compatible, I mentally say, bang, bang. bang. Like, like, I, I do, when I compute these, I don't do it the first way. I do it the second way. And when we do matrix multiplication, it's even more important to do it the second way. So what I'm saying is, take a row times the column. Take a row times the column. And it's quite clear, when I say times, I mean the dot, the dot product. So it's quite clear, you cannot take a dot product if, unless they have the same number of elements. So this row had better have the same number of elements as that column. And you keep going through and you do that as many times as you have rows. So it's quite clear in this example, we couldn't get it wrong. We could not end up with anything but a two vector. Because there's only two lines. If we follow the second prescription, or even if you follow the first, it's four times this column plus minus one times that column plus one times that column. You'll see that you have to get a two vector. So there has to be compatibility. If this number of entrants doesn't match the number of columns here, then it's incompatible. It doesn't make sense. You can't do it. All right. So uh, the whole point of this, by the way, is as follows. Remember. We had, well, I started off with the system of equations like this. And let's see, there were m columns, a 1m, xm equals b1, and so on, up until a n1, a n m equals b n. Well, that whole system. can be written as the matrix of coefficients a11 up to a1m, an1, anm, times the vector x1 up to xm. That's the left-hand side of this. Equals b1 up to bn. That's what I claim, that we've changed this into a matrix plus a vector, a matrix times a vector equals a different vector. And again, notice this is n by m times m gives you n. Why? Because when you multiply this first row dot product with this column, you get exactly this a11 times x1 plus a12 times x2, bang, 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 until you get a1m times xm. So if you actually multiply them, the first column would be a11x1 up to a1mxm. 
and that's supposed to equal You work your way down the equations, down the rows, bang, bang, second equation, bang, bang, and then finally the last equation is this row dot this, which is a one a n one x one plus a n two x two and so on up to the last one a n m x m, and this is supposed to equal b n. So all we've done is take these equations and write the left hand side as a vector of this, 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 and the right-hand side is a vector. And when we assert that the system is true, we're basically saying that two vectors are the same vector. And if two vectors are the same vector, then they must have all their components equal. So basically, this equation can be written as ax equals b, where a is the coefficient matrix, x is the unknown vector, and b is the vector of the augmentation, if you like. So A here is N by M. X is M by 1, if you like, as in M vector. And B is N by 1, so it's N vector. OK, so when you see AX equals B, that means one of these systems of equations. So the way that this matrix multiplication with vectors has been defined is basically the way that makes everything we've been doing make sense as just a simple linear equation like this. Question? When you say M vector, you mean M dimensional vector, right? The same thing? Yeah, M dimensional vector. Sorry. I did that before. There's nothing else it could mean. But yeah, I do, in fact, mean M dimensional vector. All right. So moving on to chapter two. Still have 20 minutes should be able to do 2.1. There's one little fact buried at the end of chapter 1 that's kind of significant. And that is this. We've now seen what this means. Matrix times a vector. You can use either your definition. It's the same thing. We've seen what this means. Now, if you have two vectors, x and y, then it turns out that if you take ax plus y, so that means you sum the vectors, then that will be the same thing as AX plus AY. Why? Well, in order to do it, you could say, well, the first column, if, we, if you do W1 and you have X, then the first thing will be W1.X plus Y. And it reduces to the same fact about a dot product. So if you know that's true for the dot product, then it will be true for every row or every entry in the vector. And so it's also, it does happen to be true for a dot product. And we saw that. We, we saw that uh, v dot, well, u dot v plus w equals u dot v plus u dot w. That's a, that's a math, uh, math 201 fact that we saw. So all we're doing is packing this up into many equations. And this happens to be true. Now the other thing that you can see without much difficulty is that if you multiply every component of the vector by a scalar, then this is the same thing as multiplying the matrix first and then multiplying by the scalar. After all, if I stick a 2 in front of everything here, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, then there'll be a 2 in front of everything here, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 2. And then the 2's come out of the dot products, and then the 2 can come out of the final thing. So the 2 will come all the way out, and so it doesn't matter if I multiply the vector first by 2 and then multiply the, by the matrix, or just do the matrix multiplication and multiply the final result by 2. The scalar commutes with the matrix. OK, these two properties, then, which are true for matrix times vector, define what's known as a linear transformation. So that's the, that's the next topic, general linear transformations. So the book kind of defines it one way, namely as a matrix. But I prefer to think of it geometrically. And I'm going to teach it like that 
as the book comes down to it eventually, and I'll show you that it's the thing. Anyway, so here goes. So this is perhaps the key concept of the course, believe it or not. Here it is, right at the beginning. Okay, I'm going to say, first of all, that I have a function from Rn to Rm. Okay, so what does that mean? Actually, I've got these the wrong way around. It doesn't really matter, of course, but we'll do Rm to Rn. Okay, so they could be the same dimension, or they might not. Now, Rm, of course, is this space. If m equals 1, it's the line. If m equals 2, it's a plane. 3, it's the space. And when I say a function, I mean, well, for every point in this domain, I get some other point in the range, or in the image. Well, let's call it, let's call it the codomain for the moment. You may not get all of Rn. Okay, so these functions can be very, very broad. As you know, even when m and n are both 1, you just have a regular function from r to r. There's many, many, many different functions. Okay, okay. Now, now, the first thing I'm going to do is think of it as a transformation. Okay. It's the same thing. It tr takes one point and tr in here and gives you back a point in here. You, instead of thinking of it as a function, I just want you to... It's just a mental readjustment saying, well, it's just transformed it from this to this. Okay, so if f of x equals x cubed, then f transforms 2 into 8. I mean, it's just a semantic word, but in this course, it's going to be called a linear transformation instead of a linear function. Same thing, function, transformation, same thing. Now, here is the critical property that we're looking for for a transformation to be linear. Two properties. So I'm going to say a function or transformation t, so instead of using f, I'm going to use transformation, I'm going to use capital T, is linear if, and only if, the following two properties hold. And they're going to look pretty familiar. I'm going to need T applied to the sum x plus y is equal to the sum of T of x and T of y for any vectors x and y in R, M, i.e. any M dimensional vectors. And second, I'm going to need T of kx is equal to k times T of x for any x in Rm and scalar k. So of course, these are exactly the same properties that we noted before for matrix multiplication. But now, this is not a multiplication. See, when you look at this, up here, I'm thinking of this as a times, this is this new times that we've said. I don't know what to write. I, normally you don't put anything, but I can't really put a dot or a, or a cross or anything because there's these dot products and cross products. It's just, this is a multiplication of a matrix times a vector, which I defined, bang, like this on this board. Whereas this is just a function. This is t of this. So think of it as f of this. So don't think of this as t times x. This is a a way of changing x into something else. But if these two things are true, then the function, then the, the transformation is called linear. Now, now, here, this is t preserves addition. That's how you say this. It preserves addition. What do I mean by preserve? I mean if I add them and then apply t, it's the same as applying t to each of them and then adding them. Preserves keeps. It respects the addition doesn't screw it up. And here, t preserves scalar multiplication. Scalar multiplication. Okay, so let's just see what that would look like if we just have a function from the plane to the plane. So from R2 to R2. Let's just see what's going on. No, M and N can be any numbers. Any. Can be than that. Yep, like M and N can be, M could be larger, M could be smaller, it doesn't matter. So you can have linear transformations either way or with M equals N. 
it's possible. But let's just take m equals 2 and n equals 2. And so I'm just basically given a vector in the plane, you're giving me a, another vector back. And remember, vectors can be moved around as long as you don't change their direction or length. Right? You can move the base point. So what this is saying is, suppose I have this vector uh, x, and then I have this other vector y. OK, well, t of x is some other vector. So, I don't know, there's the, here's the domain, and here's the co-domain. And again, it doesn't really matter where I put these, I can, I can sort of move them around. So tx might be over here, t of x, and then t of y could be here. Okay, so where is t of x plus y? Well, here's x plus y. It's supposed to meet at the same point. It's a completely different vector. If this function was not linear and we didn't know, then t of x plus y could be anywhere. Even if I base it here, maybe t of x plus y could be down here. Well, no, not if t is linear, because if t is linear, then t of x plus y has to be this vector. And you can transform everything, just shift everything back down to the origin if you would rather think of them as points rather than vectors. This vector here can be corresponding to this point here if the vector starts at the origin. But the point is that it's a very prescribed thing. If you know the values of two, then you get a third one for free. And it turns out this. And here is tx. Well, here's 2x. 2 times x is just twice. So you would think that t could transform this point into anything else. But no, it has to be exactly well, this. Has to equal 2t of x. Whatever you got for the first one you also get for the second one. So actually, the moral of the story, at least in the case of a 2 by 2 to 2 by 2, is that believe it or not, you only need to know what happens to the coordinate axes. I really only have time for this one big point here, but it's kind of a nice one. So suppose I know what happens to this vector 1, 0, and this vector 0, 1. So suppose that 1, 0 goes over here, t of 1, 0, whereas 0, 1 goes over here. That, and you know that t is linear. Well, that tells you everything about t. There's now no longer any ambiguity about t of any other point. You see, any other point is some multiple of this plus some multiple of this. So in fact, if you consider the point, say, 3, 2, you can think of that as 3 lots of this vector plus 2 lots of this vector. And therefore, when you transform it, you will get 3 lots of this vector plus 2 lots of this vector. And that will be t of 3, 2. And the same goes for anything. Ah, uh, shush. All right. So what do you think of that? So what I'm trying to say is that to know a linear transformation, you only need to know what it does to the vectors. So check this out. Here is my last logic, my last five minutes of logic. Okay. We now have the notion of a linear transformation. It's a function, and it's a very special function from Rn, Rm to Rn. Now, forget that. Consider this thing. I'm going to give a matrix, matrix A. a. Say 2, 3, 5, minus 1. Oh, what the hell. I'll give you this. Uh, I can think of a different number. 6. OK. That matrix gives me a linear transformation. I'm going to define t of x, the vector, to be equal to a times x. 
So this is the mate, this is the multiplication that I defined earlier. And this is going to be true for x is a three-dimensional vector. X is in R3. And Tx is going to be in R2. So this transformation is exactly this matrix times this vector. So let's write this out very precisely. T of the vector x1, x2, x3 is going to be equal to 2, 3, 4, 5, minus 1, 6 times the vector. Actually, let's not even do x1, x2, x3. Let's just do x, y, z. So if I take the dot product of this row with this column, I get 2x plus 3y plus 4z. And then 5x minus y plus 6z. So there's my function. T of x, y, z comes back with 2x plus 3y plus 4z, x minus y plus 6z. And the coefficients, of course, are exactly the coefficients in the matrix. So this is a function. You give me three numbers, any point in space, and you get back a point in the plane. So this is an example where you have n, n bigger than m. Okay? This is a linear transformation. I mean, it looks linear. Each of these things is a linear function of x, y, and z. But we know it's linear because of these properties up here. So these properties say that if you take a function which is a matrix times a vector for any given matrix, you get a linear transformation. So what I'm trying to say is we've already seen that matrices provide linear transformations. OK, so here was an example. I plucked the matrix out of the air, and I got a linear transformation from there to there, just by multiplying. The real nice point is that the reverse is true as well. well that's what I was going to use the last three or four minutes to tell you about. I started a few minutes late, so sorry, I'm going to go a few minutes over, but not long. I just want to finish this point. OK, so the point is that every linear transformation, at least finite dimensional, never mind infinite, that's much more complicated, every linear transformation from Rn to Rm can be written as a matrix multiplication. And that's a surprise. We've seen that matrix multiplication gives you a linear transformation. I'm saying for every linear transformation, there is a matrix such that that transformation is just multiplication by the matrix. So what I'm trying, trying to say is, I give you a T. How do you find the matrix? What is the matrix? Here's how you find it. You take these special vectors, E1, which is 1, 0, 0. Actually, I'll write it as a column. 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. zero. I take E2, which is a vector with a 1 in the second place, and so on up to En. Which is, wait, wait a second, why am I saying N to M? <sighs> M to N can be written as a matrix multiplication with an N by M matrix. All right, so, so this is the EM, which is the one in the nth place. So I can apply T to any of these things because they are m-dimensional vectors. OK, now what I want to do is make a matrix as follows. I'm going to take T of E1. These should really have little arrows. Now, by the way, Look at what I did over here. This is E1, and this is E2, in this case. OK? So what I'm doing is I'm seeing what happens to that vector, and I get some new vector, and I'm putting that as the first column of the matrix. And then I'm seeing what happens to E2, and I get a different vector, and I'm putting that as the second column, and so on, until I run out of coordinates. 
I don't need the lines between them. So there are m columns, but t, every time I hit it with, use t, I get back an n-dimensional vector. So this will be an n by m matrix. And I claim, so call this A, call that A. So the big claim is this. T of any vector x is just equal to A times x, the matrix multiplication. So what I'm trying to say is, for any linear transformation, you get a matrix that works. And in practice, all you have to do is just reverse everything that we did. So let's see. Here is an example. E.g. Suppose t of x comma y is equal to 3x minus y comma 2x comma minus 7y. Okay, I'm not going to prove it, but you can show that t is linear. That's the first sort of part. I claim this is a linear function. Okay, that would be a nice exercise, but I don't have time to do it, so maybe next time I'll start. But I want to show you how to find the matrix. All you have to do is realize E1 is equal to 1, 0, or if you like, as a vector, 1, 0. So T of E1, I plug in 1, 0. So I get 3, 2, 0, or as a column vector, 3, 2, 0. And T of E2, where E2 is 0, 1, or as a regular old vector, 0, 1. So I now plug in x equals 0 and y equals 1, and I get minus 1, 0, minus 7, which is otherwise known as minus 1, 0, minus 7 vertically. And so the matrix A corresponding to T I just take these column vectors and shove them side by side. 3, 2, 0, minus 1, 0, minus 7. So I've turned the transformation into a matrix. How do I know that it works? I'll just show you and then we'll be done. Here goes. Suppose you take this matrix A times the vector xy. Well, this is 3 minus 1. 2, 0, 0, 7 times xy equals first column, first row rather, 3 minus 1, dot that. And you get 3x minus y. Second row, dot that. Sorry? Minus 7 or not? Uh, yes, minus 7. Thank you. So second row is 2 times x plus 0 times y, which is just 2x. And the third one is 0 times x minus 7 times y. And look, I've reconstructed my original function. Starting with x comma y, I got back 3x minus y comma 2x comma minus 7 y. So if it seems like all we are doing is just sort of shoving numbers in different positions and just doing some bookkeeping, well, to some extent you are right. But the important thing is that this is a, math this is a symbolic formalism of how to multiply some grid by some column, whereas the other one corresponds to a geom geometry. It's a function. And what I'm trying to say is they're the same thing. All right, so that more or less finishes 2.1. Uh, so next time, we will just forge on with the course as it is.